begin. Good morning, or whatever time of day it is for you, and welcome to Philosophy Live. I'm Graham Blackbourne from the Scottish branch of the School of Philosophy and Economic Science in Edinburgh. Thank you for joining me. What can I know beyond any doubt, and how can I know it? This is a question which intrigued the philosopher and mathematician René Descartes. To speak of Descartes, known for his philosophy of so-called Cartesian dualism, may seem an odd choice for Philosophy Live, from the school which professes to teach a philosophy of non-dualism, or Adwaita. But Descartes is often called the father of modern philosophy, so he is hard to ignore, and in any case, I think we can learn from him. René Descartes was born in France in 1596, and following the death of his mother, he was brought up by his grandmother and great uncle in a Roman Catholic family. In 1607, he entered a Jesuit college and was introduced to mathematics and physics, as well as hermetic mysticism. Later, he studied law, his father being keen that he should become a lawyer. However, he was drawn to a life of inquiry and discovery, resolving to seek no knowledge other than that which he could find in himself or in the great book of the world. He travelled widely, consorted with all manner of people, and for some years enlisted as a mercenary in the Dutch state's army, where he studied military engineering and advanced his knowledge of mathematics. On a winter's night in 1619, at the age of 23, Descartes had shut himself up in a room to escape the cold when he experienced a series of three dreams, which he later attributed to a divine spirit. When he awoke, he had formulated what was to become analytic geometry and the idea of applying mathematical methods to philosophical inquiry. He had also concluded that if he could, could discover one fundamental truth, and since all truths were linked, by proceeding logically, the whole of science could be opened up to him. He decided that the pursuit of truth, true wisdom, would be his life's work. Having left the army, Descartes moved to the Netherlands, where he spent the next 20 years and did most of his writing. He gained an increasing reputation for his work, studying with many eminent scholars of the day, writing and publishing, and having a long correspondence with Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. In 1633, Galileo was condemned by the Italian Inquisition, deterring Descartes from publishing his Treatise of the World, which included thinking also likely to be condemned, though he did publish parts of it later. He also had a daughter following a relationship with a servant girl, but the little girl, Francine, died of scarlet fever at the age of five, which is said to have affected Descartes deeply. In 1649, Queen Christina of Sweden invited Descartes to her court to help set up an academy of science and to tutor her personally. It turned out they did not particularly like each other and Descartes wasn't keen on being asked to tutor her at five in the morning in her cold and drafty castle, when he usually rose at about 11. He contracted pneumonia, and at the age of just 54, he died at the home of the French ambassador. We'll come to Descartes' philosophy shortly, but his mathematics was also influential. We've probably all learned some of it at school. He devised the form of modern algebraic expressions in which, for example, the letters a, um, uh, X, Y, or Z are used to denote unknown and A, B, and C known variables, and in which powers of two and higher are shown by numbers in subscript. These methods helped Gottfried Leibniz and Isaac Newton to develop mathematical calculus. Descartes also invented what we now think of as a, a common or garden graph. on which points are designated by where they lie on the X and Y axes, and so-called or so-called Cartesian coordinates, Cartesian being from the Latin form of the name Descartes. 
Descartes also made advances in mechanics, optics, meteorology, astronomy, and physics. Some of his theories were later disproved, but they provided stepping stones from which later scientists came up with more accurate representations of the truth. Descartes had from a young age become skeptical of the received wisdom from both the ancient world and medieval philosophy, and he was moved to establish his own philosophical system, not relying on any previous thinking. In his famous work, Discourse on the Method, published in 1637, he set out principles intended to ensure his thinking was firmly grounded. The first of these was to never accept anything for true, which I did not know to be such. That is to say, carefully to avoid precipitancy and prejudice, and to comprise nothing more in my judgment than what was presented to my mind so clearly and distinctly as to exclude ground of doubt. But what could be known beyond doubt? Descartes doubted all previous authorities. He realized he had to doubt the senses, since he knew that while he was asleep and dreaming, he took the dream for reality. So he had no certainty that sense impressions were not also just an illusion. He seemed to doubt everything. But he saw that when he doubted, there must be something which was doing the doubting. And that something was himself or his soul. And so arose Descartes' famous dictum. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. A statement which has become so well known that philosophers today simply refer, it, refer to it as the cogito. The only thing which Descartes could be sure of beyond any doubt, at least to begin with, was his own self, which he regarded as a thinking being. Now, to be honest, Descartes' attempts to prove the existence of anything apart from himself can appear as sleight of hand. To paraphrase his proof for the existence of God, he saw that he could conceive quite distinctly and without doubt of a perfect being. Now, it's evident that one of the attributes of a perfect being, he thought, is that it must exist, because nothing which does not exist could be perfect. And since Descartes could conceive of this perfect being, which he called God, without any doubt, and since if there is a perfect being, it must exist, then God must exist. Furthermore, another attribute of a perfect being must be that it is incapable of falsehood and therefore does not deceive. So when I observe the world through the senses, all created by God, what I sense must be true because God would not deceive. So the world, including my own body, must exist. But, Descartes continued, the attributes of myself, or soul, are quite different from those of the world, not least in that my soul has no dimensions and is immaterial, while the world extends in space and is material. Therefore, there are two quite distinct forms of existence, that of the soul and that of the body. This became known as mind-body, or Cartesian dualism. Now, this brief summary hardly does justice to Descartes' thinking. His works need to be read to appreciate the depth of his thought. Over the following 150 years or so, his philosophy engendered a wealth of new ideas in the field of philosophy known as epistemology, about what we can know and how we can know it, from empiricists such as George Berkeley, David Hume and John Locke, who consider that all we can know is derived from sense experience, and rationalists, including Descartes, but also Baruch Spinoza and Gottfried Leibniz, who argued that true knowledge arises through the use of reason. This debate continues to the present day. I think very few philosophers nowadays hold to Descartes' mind-body dualism in quite the way he meant it, but I take from Descartes' philosophical method several principles which can serve us well whether we engage in philosophical inquiry or simply wish to act a little more wisely more of the time. 
The first is to recognize that one's own self is all that we can be directly sure of. Secondly, we should examine our thinking and our opinions and not accept anything as true without considering whether there are good reasons for doing so. And lastly, remember to use that wonderful human faculty of reason, especially in everyday matters, perhaps by simply stopping and asking ourselves the question, what would a wise man or woman do here? So here's how philosophy might help us today. And thank you. Next week on Monday, there'll be Sanskrit Live again, with Economics Live on Tuesday, Awareness Live on Wednesday, and Philosophy Live next Friday. Thanks again. Have a good day and enjoy your weekend.